Hello, Jeepal, and welcome back to the Willys 1943 MB project. Thanks for checking in today, guys. Subscribers, thank you as always. It's much appreciated. You guys uh, keep me going, which is fantastic. Um, you can just take your seats at the back there and we'll get started shortly. If you're new here, thanks today, guys. What we're doing is working on a Willys 43 MB, um, but what we're doing unusually is I'm building it from the ground up. So rather than starting out with an actual Jeep and then taking it all apart and reassembling it, I'm bringing together all these different parts that I'm able to get from all sorts of different places. And I'm going to create a single Jeep out of all these different pieces and hope that it's going to be pretty good, okay? There is a method to my madness and we are getting somewhere. Franken Jeep is coming along, which is good news, but uh, all will be revealed shortly. If you're not subscribed, click on the Jeep symbol in the bottom uh, corner there, turn on notifications and you'll be kept up to date with my videos, which will be much appreciated. So guys, following on from the uh, video last week then, uh, I made a post on the G503 forum, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's the best place on the internet really for Willie's Jeep information. And I was just giving some pointers about getting that contact pattern correct, um, which I took into account, took the uh, ring gear out a couple of times, played with the axle, and I managed to get a good contact pattern. So it wasn't the machining of the, the Spicer uh, ring gear and pinion. There's no limitation to it. It was just my, I hadn't done enough work with it. So like most things on a Jeep, like I keep telling people, things may seem you know impossible or how do you move on with here? You might have spent hours doing something and then you, you feel like you've reached a dead end. The thing with working on Jeeps is there's really no dead ends. Um, it's a simple vehicle. All problems can be solved. Whether it's a matter of money, time, or just changing your whole mindset about how you're gonna do something, you know, what you might thought, uh, have thought would be a simple job suddenly becomes a much more difficult job. All the problems can be solved. You just have to take a step back, think about it, reassess the way you're gonna approach something and then move on with it. And that means that you can move on with anything with a Jeep. So that's what I did with the, uh, the ring gear and the axle. I just took a step backwards, left it for a little while, got some external information, came back to it, just carried on working at it and we managed to get a good ring gear pattern out of it. So that's really good. Uh, the uh, axle is not completely finished yet. It's still got a bit of work to do to it, but we're moving on with it. So that's all excellent news. The next thing then, guys, is the other day then, this uh, block came back to me. So a lot of the time, or some of the time when rebuilding Jeeps, what you find is that the uh, block comes back with a crack in it. And the most likely place to have a crack is down here below the distributor, okay? So when the block is filled full of water with no antifreeze and it freezes, obviously frozen water expands. And when it's inside a sealed block, there's nowhere for that to expansion to go. Cast iron, which the block is made out of, is very brittle. So when it expands, all it does is it breaks it at the weakest point. And the weakest point is here, and it goes across in an eye shape often. Not all the time, but it, it usually breaks along there, or along this side here. Doesn't seem to break on this side, uh, the other side with all the valve gear, obviously, because there's all sorts of casting in there and more strength, but it's this large area here, okay? So if you've got a broken block, that might seem a bit of a bummer, okay? This one came to me uh, with a big lead scab patch on it down here, okay, guys? So there was a big patch there, and I thought, well, we'll see how it is. We'll see if we can get away with that. It looks like quite a professional job. But obviously, when I started working away at it, I saw there was some sort of seepage going on there. We're trying to do this Jeep properly. This is going to be a good one. So I didn't want to just leave it. So I thought I'd get it fixed the correct way, okay? So the options available to you when the block is broken is to do uh, one of two things. Well, one of three things. You can jump the block and find a better one. In America, they're not too expensive. There's quite a lot available, um, so it's not that bad really. But if you're in the UK or Europe, they're more expensive. And if the block is the correct block, the matching block to your Jeep, you definitely don't want to junk it. You want to keep it because you want to use this block in your Jeep because then you'll have a matching numbers Jeep, or at least you have a matching number engine to your Jeep, which is always fantastic for originality and saleability at the end of it, guys. So you can junk it, keep it, or you can lock and stitch it, or you can weld it, okay? Lock and stitching is a method where you've got a, you've got a hairline crack you just drill it out. There's a special kit you get from Lock and Stitch. You drill it out, you put in these little locks, and all you do is replace that um, crack with pieces of metal instead. So you walk these little pieces of metal in there and you fill up that crack with the metal, these little nickel inserts, and that's how you do it. You just replace the crack with metal and it's done manually. There's no heating or anything like that required. And it seems to be a pretty good process, I think. Um, but on, in this case, on the block, I went with welding. Now, the reason I went with welding, as we'll be able to see in these pictures, is that um, 
An interesting thing is about when it breaks, um, so if the block just has a hairline crack in it on the top up here, um, then there's been no, you know, it's not due to it, the, the pressure inside it bending the metal out and pushing it out, it's just due to it cracking due to fatigue or whatever. Um, then you can just replace the crack with metal, that's fine. But when the area has been flat and then it's been pushed out, when it pushes out, obviously it's not just breaking where the crack is, is it? You can see with my hands here, there's gotta be movement down here as well. So it's been weakened, not just in the crack, but in other places as well. And you can see on my block, when they started taking it apart, the two pieces came out in massive chunks, okay? So if I had just lock and stitch that central crack there, there would still be those weaker areas at either side left, okay? Now, is that actually a problem with a Jeep block? Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. Lots of people have lock and stitched the blocks with no issue. Um, the pressures aren't massive in the block or anything like that in the water jacket, so maybe it's perfectly fine. But at the same time, you can see how it fell apart here. So perhaps you do want to have those pieces replaced and you do want to have the whole thing done properly. So a lock and stitch just on the um, crack wouldn't do those bits down the side either. So that's just something to bear in mind there when it comes to lock and stitching. But we got this welded by a specialist. Um, and as you guys probably know, cast iron is not something you can weld at home really, um, because it's got a really high carbon content in it. It's extremely brittle. And when you're using, when you're welding it, um, you put a lot of heat into a small space. And when it contracts afterwards, um, because there's no sort of give in um, cast iron, instead of bending or just being malleable, the whole thing just shatters or cracks and you just have cracks which get bigger and bigger and bigger and the whole thing falls apart. So to get around that, a guy who welds it up properly will heat the whole block up to a really, really high temperature, okay? So the whole block is at the same temperature, nearly the sort of temperature that it's needed for welding, you know, if you're actually welding it, and then they'll weld it. And then they allow it to cool down extremely slowly. So any of the stresses built up in the block are slowly relieved rather than if it's a cold block and you just put a hot electrode on it or hot gas, it just has that really hot spot in one tiny place, which is different to the rest of the block. So when, they, when it cools, it contracts and pulls it all in and the rest of the block doesn't contract at the same rate and it cracks, okay? So if you cool it down really slowly, the whole thing, it uh, doesn't crack. Some cracks will form. My one developed an extra crack, but they were able to deal with that quite um, easily. You know, that was expected. Um, so you really need to send it off to a specialist and it's a slow process, it's a difficult process and it needs somebody who knows what they're doing. So in the UK, I was able to find a guy who could do it and the cost for it, so it was 500 pounds, not including postage, in, and that was including tax. So I think a lot of work was required here. You know, the whole thing has to be heated up, has to be cleaned. You have to get bits of cast iron to replace the bits you pulled out. You have to do all sorts of things. You have to have the skills to do it as well. So for 500 pounds, um, repairing the cracked block, I think is a pretty good, a pretty good deal, really. I think they've done a pretty good job. Um, it doesn't look the prettiest um, at the moment. I've removed all the filler that you guys could have seen earlier when we saw there, you know, they they'd just dressed it off and everything. But obviously I needed to clean the block out properly. Um, so I've removed all of that. But um, it's been pressure tested and it's all good to go, you know. Um, I'm really pleased with it. The block itself um, had a load of sediment in the bottom and I've put this back in the electrolysis bath. Initially I only put it in for a day, which was far too short a time. I put it back in for about a week, left it going, and all of that sludge which is in the bottom, all that sediment has cleared out now. It was all compacted, you know, when you just put water in there, it can't get down through that sediment. Um, so if you leave it to soak in there, it can start to get in and break it all up and everything. So now this, um, uh, hole here to drain, the drain hole on the jacket there is now clear, water flows out of it. There's no rust left inside here, so it's all good. So I'm really pleased with it, guys. It's now a nice bare block ready to go for machining, okay? So yeah, that's just one thing to think about then. If you've got a uh, old block, whether you want to repair it using lock and stitch or repair it using welding. Welding does seem to be the better way to go, guys, I think, for a, a break like we've got on this one, you know, the water jacket break. So. Have a think about it. It's, it is an interesting thing. It can be done. You just got to find the right person to do it, okay? And there are still guys out there. In America, you'll probably have a much easier time finding a guy who knows what he's doing. But in the UK, it's a little bit more difficult. But I'm pleased with it. So we can move on with the engine then once we've got the axle and running gears on the uh, frame. And hopefully there are no more surprises in this. Of course, I haven't actually had 
this block machined or anything like that yet, so we could still find something nasty with it, but I'm hoping it's going to be okay. Um, but yeah, that's it guys. That is uh, welding up uh, World War II Jeep blocks. It can be done and it seems to be a good process. The best choice for repairing them, I think. So just something to think about there. But that's it then for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. As I said, if you're not subscribed, subscribe and uh, click on notifications. And I will see you next week. Have a good week jeeping. Cheers.